So welcome back, and uh, perhaps welcome to uh, the module you've been most looking forward to, which is machine learning. Uh, we're really getting into the kind of core money-making part of data science right now, the ability to create high-complexity predictive models um, that really, you know, can do things that we couldn't do before uh, in statistics. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, mysticism and magical thinking surrounding machine learning, uh, where pe people say they're going to use, we're going to use machine learning or we're going to use AI in order to do blank. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of this assumption that there's something magical going on that is enabling us to do things with computers that we couldn't do before. The truth is uh, quite quite mundane, really, that these most of what we're going to talk about and most of what machine learning currently is are natural incremental evolutions of things that we already have in statistics. Thus, today, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about this difference uh, between statistics versus AI and machine learning and how those terms work together. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of statistics versus machine learning quite directly, how they are similar and how they are different. Um, some of the terminology that you're going to encounter in the machine learning literature that you don't really encounter so much in the uh, stats literature. Uh, and then go a technical walkthrough of how to actually execute some machine learning stuff in R. Uh, it is uh, much easier than you would think it would be. Uh, and if you've gone through the data camp material, uh, you've, already, you've already seen this. Uh, most of it is terminological differences. Because when you approach machine learning, you're, do, you're usually looking at materials and information through the lens of a computer scientist, whereas when you look at stats material, you're looking at it through the lens of a statistician, and they have different words for the same things, uh, despite a pretty substantial overlap between the areas. So the first thing to, to clarify in all of this is what exactly is artificial intelligence? Uh, AI is, a, is probably one of the most abused terms in data science right now. Uh, it's used to refer to uh, just about anything that people want to make sound special and magic. Uh, in reality, all AI refers to is when you take uh, some kind of algorithmic, algorithmic decision-making system uh, and you use it to mimic people. Uh, and it can be basically anything. Any sort of human behavior can be mimicked. What we see right now in terms of AI is what's called weak AI or a narrow AI, uh, which is where we try to mimic individual human systems one at a time in very tightly defined ways. Um, one of the very earliest types of AIs that people are familiar with and have an everyday connection with is object character recognition, where, say, for example, you have a PDF and you say, well, I need to convert this PDF into... Uh, text. Well, in most cases, you're going to use an OCR uh, AI, and that AI is going to convert your picture of a PDF, say, for example, from a scanned, you know, a scanned book, a scanned textbook, something like that, um, and it's going to convert it into text. That is a type of AI, because we're actually trying to convert a picture into something more meaningful for human consumption, uh, a specific area of AI called computer vision. So that's just, that's one example of a very narrow AI. Siri, Alexa, these technologies that, uh, that seem to be interfaces with, uh, you know, a communicative artificial intelligence that we're talking to, in reality are quite narrow. Uh, in most cases, those technologies are just listening for keywords or key phrases, and they are constantly improving the databases where there's new phrases and new words that they're listening for and new functionality, but those are, in, those are being programmed. Those are being actually selected. It's not as if Siri and Alexa are capable of free thought. Uh, instead, they are only capable of processing the kind of uh, data and information that they've been told to process. Uh, if you play video games, those uh, we, we've for a long time called those AIs. In some cases, those AIs are very simple, uh, extraordinarily simple, in fact, where in the old classic video games, I used to do a, a little bit of video game uh, map development back uh, many years ago. Uh, what we would think of as an artificial intelligence back in the old days was, in fact, a programmer saying, all right, first, this character needs to move from here to here. And it would just literally be that instruction. Uh, and that was AI. It mimics human function and saying, if a human were playing, what would they do? But there's nothing more complex than a programmer literally selecting, oh, this is what should happen. Uh, natural language processing is an example of another type of artificial intelligence, one which we'll talk about in the last module, uh, the module after this. Google Translate, for example, is a type of artificial intelligence uh, where you're saying, well, it's, 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 it's in one language, and how would a human translate this into another language? Thus, an AI question. 
At the end, we, uh, we of course have just machine learning. Machine learning itself is a way to make predictions of uh, data from other data. And we'll go through several different examples of that uh, in this module. Uh, but it is also a very narrow AI. Uh, even if you take examples like self-driving cars, that's fundamentally a very simple prediction problem. Uh, where we say, let's take a bunch of input, like the cameras surrounding this self-driving car, the map that's being read from the self-driving car, and get a prediction of what is the correct uh, response in terms of how hard to push the accelerator, how hard to push the brake, and which way should the wheel be turned. That's a prediction problem at its core. Uh, and so that's, a very, that's using machine learning, and that's a very narrowly defined AI. When people say AI, they usually actually mean a strong AI or what's called a general AI, which is one that is actually capable of mimicking human thought. Uh, so that's mostly been viewed in the context of film. So if, we, if you think about 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, if you think of AI or Her, any of these movies that have come out uh, that really are about you know a computer talking to you in real time and reinteracting, uh, and, and responding in an intelligent way, those are more general AIs. Uh, even if you think about, if you think about something like a Star Trek type, uh, you know, uh, ship computer, that's getting into that line. Maybe that's a general AI, may, AI, maybe it's a narrow AI. We actually don't really have enough information to know. Uh, that, that is that line that gets crossed though, that when we get to strong AI, we're really talking about a, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be self-aware, but it needs to at least mimic consciousness from humans. Uh, to get to that point, we are an extremely long way away. Uh, we are at an absolute, extremely optimistic minimum decades away and probably closer to a century or two to get to a true strong AI. But not really because the technology doesn't exist in terms of the predictive problems, but because the technology doesn't exist in terms of the hardware, uh, we don't really have a way to process, we don't have the way to create a machine that can process as quickly and as efficiently as a human brain, for example. The, uh, the wet parts uh, of our brains uh, are the efficiency by which neurons can fire. We just can't mimic in terms of developed hardware technology. So there is not even a physical hardware on which to build a strong AI at this point, let alone to work out the software computational issues involved. So we are, we are extremely far away from that. Um, it's why we, we started to hear th about things like quantum computing or nanoscale computing. Those are all efforts to try to get better and better hardware where we can get to the stage where we can have strong AI. Uh, but we are, we are way away from that, probably outside any of our lifetimes. Uh, so don't, don't hold your breath on that one. Uh, but narrow AIs are going to just improve in, improve in their predictive efficiency, and in, we're going to have more and more capabilities in terms of what a narrow AI can do, even to the point where they can mimic strong AIs in more convincing ways. Uh, when we talk about things like um, uh, increasingly in Japan, there's an, an aging population. Most of their population is actually uh, kind of in that moving toward that retirement age, and there's a very small, much smaller youth population, which create a crisis in terms of caring for the elderly. Uh, they've been using robots and narrow AIs to better and better mimic uh, home care and uh, assistive, assistance needed by the elderly who have limited mobility and other these kind these kind of issues, uh, but using narrow AIs to do that. We, we would want a general AI. We would want, for example, a robot that could mimic being a nurse. That's not possible right now and probably won't be for a very long time. But what we can do is decompose that job into specific uh, nurse duties and then try to create narrow AI, AIs for each of those individual responsibilities and tasks. So that's, that's the approach people are taking right now. And machine learning is a, a piece of that problem. Uh, in terms of actually mach understanding machine learning itself, it is very important to realize you've already learned a lot of this. Uh, by definition, if you're in uh, social sciences, you've, pro you've had at least one stats class, I'm hoping. Uh, you might have had two or three. I think in grad school I had uh, nine-ish. Uh, so your, the education may vary, but at the very least you've had some you know, basic introduction to the idea of statistics and statistical modeling, uh, especially regression, which we also talked about a, a number of modules ago in, in terms of how to do it in R. If you have that basis and if you're refreshed on it, you will find a lot of the concepts in machine learning very familiar. Uh, a lot of the time there are... It's just new words for things that you already know and that you already do. Uh, for example, you often hear the term training set uh, or test set. And on first blush, that seems like, oh, it sounds like a new concept. Uh, 
But in reality, all a training set is, is what we would call in social science, a data set. Something that you build a model on. So if I go out and collect data, I get 300 cases in Qualtrics or whatever, and I put that into R, that is a training set. I have created a training set, uh, which really just means a data set that is intended to train an AI, which really just means a data set from which to build a predictive model. So when you, you create a regression uh, model, you just run regression and you create a regression model, y equals bx plus a, and you do that uh, in R, you have used a training set to train a model. That's how a, 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 compu a computer scientist refer to it, whereas you would just say, oh, I ran regression on this data set I got off Qualtrics. It's the same thing. It is just different terminology for the same processes. Similarly, the word train itself is simply is what we would call running a model, where, where you take, uh, say you take your data set as input, and then you uh, run regression on that uh, data set in order to create your predictive model on the other side. Uh, that is training a model. And that's just the way they refer to it. It's no different. It's exactly what you've already done before. So uh, the key, I think, to machine learning for a social scientist is really relating it back to these concepts you're already familiar with and then just saying, okay, what is, what is the part that's familiar that I've already done? And then where truly is the, the new piece? What is actually pushing beyond uh, where, what I was able to do before? And there are absolutely new things here. Uh, it's just that fundamentally it's not, it's not at the very base all that different. Uh, the, the sides and the, 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 the extra capabilities around the edges, those are a little different as we'll, as we'll see. Uh, you probably are already using uh, machine learning in some way. Uh, a question I like to ask is, have you created an ordinary least squares linear regression model? Have you done LM, Y on X1 plus X2? If so, yes. Congrats, you're a data scientist, because that is the first thing that people learn in these data science courses, is how to do regression. Uh, you also, you've probably done a lot of different variations uh, on some of the analyses that we're going to be talking about. Um, if you've done cluster analysis, for example, congrats, you've done unsupervised learning. Uh, good for you. Uh, we're going to, again, step through a lot of these examples, and you're going to hopefully see what's new and what's not. Uh, but there is a lot that's not. Uh, OLS regression itself is not necessarily a, a machine learning method, but at the same time, it can be solved using machine learning methods uh, because the approach taken can be modified and you still end up with the same kind of answer. So we'll, we'll, de we'll kind of unpack that as we go. Uh, in general, there are different goals with statistics versus machine learning. In statistics, there's a big focus on coefficient interpretability. Uh, we are really emphasizing assumption checking uh, to make sure that, you know, the specific mathematics that we're applying makes sense and work. And we're ultimately asking a question, given a particular theoretical model, how well do the data describe why? So if we're using regression, for example, we would say, okay, are we, do we see homogeneity of variance across the predictor space? Uh, do we have multicollinearity issues? You look at all these different assumptions about what uh, and how those, and how violation of those assumptions would affect uh, the accuracy of your model, and then you say, okay, well now our assumption checks are fine. What is our final R squared? Great. Can I interpret individual regression weights along the way? Great. That's the point. That's what we do in statistics. A lot of the emphasis is on those individual coefficient prediction pieces. Uh, if you're familiar, if you're coming from more of an ANOVA framework, it's the same basic idea, of course, as we talked about a bit in those weeks, where instead of, uh, we, we call them main effects and interactions. In reality, we're just looking at uh, the uh, properties associated with individual coefficients in your kind of general, uh, general linear model uh, model. <laughs> so uh, when we look at uh, when we look at those models and we try to interpret what do these predictors mean, how do they mean, do, are there main effects, are there interactions, what is the meaning of the post hoc test, etc., all of that is really fundamentally uh, statistical methods about interpreting coefficients. When we go into machine learning, that is not usually the goal. Uh, instead, we're looking at generalizable prediction of the model as a whole, intended to take... Uh, in most cases, the, the goal is to take the model that you create here and then use it somewhere else. In statistics, especially with the kind of publishing that is very common in social science, uh, at least right now, in terms of quote-unquote theory testing, uh, the approach is generally, all right, I have a theory. It says this variable and this variable are important. So let me go uh, run some tests associated with that importance. And if I find statistical significance and it's of a sufficient effect size, yes, they are important. And I'm going to conclude that in my paper. 
In machine learning, you would pretty much never do that because the goal is instead to say, well, how does this model work as a whole? Say that I have 25 predictors. I want to say, well, how can I use these 25 predictors in the most efficient way so that in a new data set, I'm going to get the best prediction possible in a consistent way? That is usually the approach instead. Given these, datas, given these data, what algorithm will predict most consistently in other data sets with similar generative characteristics, meaning the data set came from the same kind of causal forces? There's a really interesting paper um, by uh, Yarkoni and Westfall, which you can read uh, on the idea of prediction versus explanation, which I think is a really landmark paper in the machine learning space. And I would really point you directly toward that. Uh, I think it's in Psych Methods. That's a guess, though. Uh, but uh, Yarkoni and Westfall really explored this idea of when do we, in what situations in social science or in psychology in that case, do we not actually care about individual coefficients? In what situations does overall prediction make more sense as a goal of research? Uh, so that's, that's the difference. That's the basic uh, difference in philosophical approach between the two. Whereas in statistics, it's all about individual coefficient interpretability. And in machine learning, it's much more about how well does this model perform overall. There are many different types of machine learning, uh, ways that you can go about addressing this kind of prediction problem. Uh, the most common and the one that was the focus in the data camp assigned with this module is supervised learning. And all supervised learning really means is that the computer's learning is supervised by data. What that really means is that you have a DV and you're trying to predict that DV from IVs. That's it. That's the whole point. Supervised learning are our prediction of known dependent variables, uh, known outcomes, known just some number that you want to predict for whatever reason. Uh, and you have a set of predictors from which to do it. There are two ways that these are referred to, and this is sometimes a little confusing for people coming from a social science background. If you have a continuous DV, we have a family of what are called regression models, even though regression models sometimes are quite far away from ordinary least squares regression. They're all called regression models. Uh, and then we have classification models, which are when we have discrete DVs. So say, for example, you have dichotomous or polydomous data, where you have two, three, four, however many categories as your DV. Uh, that's a classification model. We have uh, decision trees, which is uh, usually a type of classification model. It also could be a regression model, depending on how you do it, uh, which is where uh, you are essentially making decisions in a hierarchical fashion. You're trying to figure out uh, what is the ultimate goal of prediction. I'm trying to really predict this value really well. And you say, all right, well, what if we split it this way? What if we split it this way? And you make uh, a series of decisions all targeted at that final goal. And we'll go in much more detail about that in a little bit. Uh, but that covers things like uh, trees and random forests, which is random forests being a very popular type of supervised learning model, um, which you might have heard of before. Uh, unsupervised learning, as you might expect then, are prediction problems where you don't have a DV, which really means you're trying to figure out if there's some kind of categorical system uh, underlying this, the numbers that you have available. Principal components analysis is probably a, un, an unsupervised learning algorithm which you have used before because it is the basis, um, it is conceptually the basis for factor analysis, which we do quite a lot in, in social science. We're trying to do dimension reduction on complex continuous data. So PCA is actually the foundation of most unsupervised learning models. Uh, extraordinarily popular, and it is the very first algorithm that data scientists learn. Notice how weirdly I just said that from a social science perspective. For unsupervised learning, PCA is the first algorithm you learn, whereas from a social science or psych perspective, I would probably say something more like, uh, well, if you're interested in dimension reduction for, uh, let's say, a complex you know, multi-item survey, if I wanted to figure out what categories that, got, that, that uh, uh, fell into, you know, PCA might be the first thing I tried, or maybe factor analysis. Just a different way of talking about it, but fundamentally the same analysis. I mean, in this case, literally identical. It is the same thing that you've already done. Uh, K-means clustering, another one which you might already know, uh, is a type of cluster analysis, where instead of trying to come up with categories by variable, we're trying to come up with categories by case. Uh, so K-means clustering, and a more machine learning-y one is Ga uh, Gaussian mixture modeling, which uh, combines some of these features into a much more complex uh, sort of approach. There are also two more categories which are less relevant for social science, I think, think, 
but you still might run into them. Uh, supervise, a semi-supervised machine learning is what it sounds like, where it combines some supervised and some unsupervised aspects. Usually that means you have a very large uh, set of data without a DV, but you have, and you have a subset that does have a DV. Uh, that, in that situation, there's an argument that you should just build your data based on the unsupervised portion if you're interested in unsupervised or just the supervised portion if you're interested in just the supervised. So say, for example, you have 150,000 cases worth of data and you've had your undergrads rate 100 of them. Well, the, uh, like undergrad research assistants. Then there's an argument, well, just use the 100. That would be a supervised question. There's another argument, well, use, just use the 100 and whatever thousand and use unsupervised methods like cluster analysis or factor analysis or whatever was relevant. Uh, there's another camp, though, that would say, well, we can get even better prediction if we combine those two together in one process. So that's, that's semi-supervised learning where some of your data are labeled, meaning they have DVs, and some of your data are not. And you just combine all of that into one analysis. Uh, reinforcement learning is something that uh, you are, I think, more unlikely, even more unlikely to encounter. What happens in really complex uh, machine learning systems that we use right now, say, for example, predictive algorithms for like Netflix, like how does Netflix know what you like to watch? Well, if, you, if Netflix relied entirely on supervised methods, that means every time it wanted to update its recommendations algorithm, it would need to collect the entire data set associated with recommendations and then uh, rerun the model, just like you would, like almost like download it into R, rerun the model, okay, here's my new predictive model, upload that back to Netflix and have that do more predictions. And the problem with that is it's very resource intensive to do that because you have to pull, I mean, think about the size of the Netflix database. It must be just r ridiculously huge. Uh, so instead, these reinforcement learning approaches take uh, uh, what you would call a reinforcement approach, meaning that you have a model and you add a certain number of cases to it and you have to figure out, well, what are the rules under which adding cases improves prediction? When should we add those cases? How do we update the model, et cetera? And you don't have to get all of the original data before you do that. You can just continuously update the model. Say you just have like a, a refresh uh, as, as more data come in. Say, for example, your model determines, ah, I only have enough new information every 10,000 additional cases. And also old data, um, uh, old predictions, that are more than two weeks old are less informative than predictions that are less than two weeks old. And it can use all of that information to just update the model rather than rebuild it from scratch. So that's that's more of a practical problem to solve. Uh, so if you're doing, I mean, if you were doing something really complex with real data that actually faced human beings uh, versus just the results of output in, a, in a, like a research article that you publish, um, it, it, it might be more relevant for that, but I think for most social scientific applications, reinforcement learning is probably not quite so important. Uh, it might, it might one day be, but it, right now it's sufficiently unimportant that we're not going to talk about it any more than that. Focusing instead almost entirely on supervised because that's, that mimics what we usually do. We're usually doing regressions or ANOVA family analyses. Uh, so that's, that's just where we're going to focus, but be aware that all of these other types exist and you can do them very, in a very similar way to what we're doing here. The, uh, actual, uh, process in R is not all that different. Here's a, a classic machine learning cheat sheet in terms of how to determine what specific model you want to use, what specific, uh, uh machine learning approach. Uh, if you look through this, you will notice the top two, Regression and classification then are essentially your supervised set, and the bottom dimensionality reduction and clustering are your unsupervised set. Uh, and if you look through even closer, you will notice all of the, the breakdowns I just gave you are represented in there. That for regression, we're talking about predicting a DV. Uh, specifically, we're predicting some sort of continuous outcome. And in classification, we're predicting a discrete categorical type of outcome. Uh, and then for clustering, we have, we're trying to look at, uh, trying to identify emergent groups. You might call them latent groups of cases, uh, whereas dimensionality reduction is latent groups of variables. So that's, that's all it is. And this is often, this specific graphic is actually the starting point for a lot of people in these machine learning approaches. Uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of little decisions that are not super common uh, in the context of uh, statistical analyses, and there's a lot more options. Uh, I will warn you, though, that this is a tiny subset of all the options actually available. Whereas we tend to, in social science, say, okay, what's the correct approach 
to this prediction problem. In an in, when you have more of an engineering mindset, when you're coming from it from this kind of data science comp sci perspective, you instead say, "All right, there are quite literally thousands of different algorithms I could use here. Which one makes the most sense in this context? And if I have a bunch that makes sense, how do I discover which one is actually the best?" So this graphic serves as kind of an organizing structure slash starting point, but there are many engineering steps that occur after this in order to identify what your best models actually you know are. Uh, so it gets the complexity gets quite high quite quickly. Why use uh, supervised machine learning? What problems does it actually solve? Um, why bother with any of this? Um, the answer is that when you have a lot of predictors, a very complex predictor space, the overall effect estimates that you get, um, you know, the R squareds, are start going to start to become inflated. And it's worse. Uh, this is what we would call an N to K ratio or K to N ratio. When you have dramatically more, when, when your uh, N to K ratio is low, when you have a relatively small number of cases per variable, then our traditional methods start to break down. Uh, say, for example, you have 50 variables and 100 cases. Well, that means you have a lot of information in your data set uh, per case. So that means that the, what the model's going to do, what regression naturally does, is optimize itself to the data set you have, not to data sets like general, a more generalizable set of data sets that you might have in the future. And so you're going to end up with very inflated estimates of R squared. Your coefficients are all going to become huge because they're all kind of optimized toward predicting individual cases. It gets the worst when you start getting in, start getting close to uh, zero degrees of freedom, a just identified model, uh, where or uh, under identified model. Or say, for example, you have uh, two million uh, two million variables and a hundred cases, uh, which is actually not an uncommon problem in uh, machine learning contexts because of the types of problems they try to solve. Uh, you're going to end up with uh, you know r squared of one because what's going to happen is every individual case can be predicted with a combination of unique variables. Like we can just say, all right, predictors one through 100,000, we can just use individually to predict this one case. Uh, and so that creates a lot of problems uh, in terms of your uh, predictive accuracy. In psychology and in social science in general, we usually use a statistic called the adjusted R-squared to account for situations similar to this. Say, for example, we have a pretty standard psych data set, would be 200 people, maybe 250. Uh, lower than that if you're in social psychology. Um, but say you have 200 and 250 people and you get 30 predictors. Well, we know a priori that because those, it's, they're not going to be orthogonal, those, uh, those predictors are going to be correlated with each other to some degree, that multicollinearity is going to cause some problems. And also just the sheer number of predictors is going to lead our R-squared to be a little inflated. So we calculate these adjusted R-squareds as an estimate of, well, all right, out of sample, how much would prediction probably be? Uh, that is ultimately a guess. It, is a, it has a lot of assumptions as to what an, uh, as to, to an accurate adjusted R-squared that are not always met, and we're also really pretty bad about checking assumptions behind adjusted R-squared. We just kind of report it. If you even pay attention to it in the first place, we just report it and say, oh, and adjusted was you know, a lot lower. Machine learning approaches are really optimized in some way to figure out what that true prediction is out of sample. They are designed explicitly for that purpose. So when n is orders of magnitude larger than k, if you had 200,000 cases and 10 predictors, there is virtually nothing that machine learning will get you that you wouldn't get out of ordinary least squares regression. It's, it could arguably be better in certain situations, but uh, in practice, practically speaking, probably not. Uh, and we've seen a couple of papers now emerge in, in, in my field, in industrial organizational psychology, comparing these machine learning methods to... Uh, more traditional regression-based approaches, and in a lot of the classic prediction scenarios that we encounter, which is usually like, again, two or 300 people and five predictors, 10 predictors, you don't really get a lot out of machine learning. In some cases, you don't get anything, and in some cases, machine learning is actually much worse, depending on how you have put your solution together. 
so all of that really means that uh, we, if you're going to use machine learning, one, look at that Yarconi Westfall paper, uh, and two, you're really talking about situations where ordinary least squares predict regression, we already know a priori isn't going to work very well because of a highly complex predictor space that OLS regression just doesn't handle very well. That's, that's where you want to use machine learning. Machine learning does add a lot of complexity. Uh, that can be very bad, though, and there are some problems that we, we create by using machine learning. One is simple model selection, that when you have, uh, you know, 1,500 different model types to choose between, if you don't know what you're doing, it's really easy to mislead people uh, in terms of, and including yourself, in terms of the success and value of those methods. Uh, parameter selection, choosing uh, variables, is also highly uh, researcher-specific, and the configuration of what are called hyperparameters is also very specific. So if, you're, if you haven't heard those terms, uh, they're actually things you're familiar with. Uh, model selection just means choosing the approach. So when you say, oh, should we use ANOVA or regression? That is essentially a model selection problem, except now we're choosing among many more models. Uh, parameter selection is really, well, which variables are relevant to the problem we're trying to solve? That's easy. Hyperparameters tend to be the more uh, abstract of these concepts, but it's not really. Hyperparameters refer to overall configurations that one uses in these different models. Uh, say, for example, you're looking at uh, an ANOVA framework. Should we use a type 2 or type 3 sum of squares? That is a hyperparameter that you've chosen. It's a configuration option within the model that you're choosing that changes the way that the coefficients are either calculated or interpreted or displayed or, or something. Uh, model selection itself in some ways is a hyperparameter and it can be treated that way. There are actually machine learning approach approaches for choosing models. Um, and existential decision making is itself a, a, a kind of a hyperparameter. Like when you make a choice to use a statistical model versus a machine learning model, you are making one of these higher level choices that influences the way the models play out. Um, so all of these features in machine learning, because they're very explicit and they're not based on sort of rules of thumb and standard ways of doing things as a lot of stuff in stats is, means that there are a huge number of researcher degrees of freedom in choosing how models are executed and interpreted and run and so on. Uh, all of these models, uh, well, not all, most of these models are optimized to what's called a cost function or a loss function, which is in terms of minimizing some kind of error. And we'll get into a very deep example of that in a little bit. Um, but the choice of cost function becomes a major aspect of hyperparameter selection in models. So what is it that we're trying to solve for, essentially, in creating a model? That's, uh, that's what... That's, that's what uh, hyperparameter selection about cost functions really concerns. If you're trying to get every last little bit of variance out of a model, regardless of where it comes from, you sometimes need to get pretty creative in terms of developing your, your models, both in terms of choosing a model and in terms of choosing predictors. It comes with this interpretability versus prediction trade-off, uh, which we'll get into in a little more depth in just a minute. Uh, and you, but you have to be very cautious. Would it be, you have to answer questions for yourself, for example, like, does it make more sense for me to make a research, prior research informed decision and pick just, you know, the eight predictors I know make sense here? Or should I just throw in all 300 predictors I have and just give up the idea of knowing what any individual predictor contributes to that model? And that's a choice one makes in machine learning by kind of throwing out interpretability, uh, at least in terms of individual coefficients. Uh, Every algorithm in machine learning has its own research literature, and the complexity of those research literatures are at least, if, no, if, more if not more complex, than the courses you've had on ANOVA and regression. The assumption, the approach in machine learning, and in statistics for that matter, is very different. We, in the social sciences, and this is mostly psychology's fault, because a lot of, a lot of bad habits originated with psychology, uh, and have just slowly sort of filtered out um, to other social sciences that uh, we want there to be a right answer in terms of model selection. So we want to say, all right, well, given I have, you know, this kind of outcome and this kind of predictors and this number and they're skewed and they're, you know, they have whatever other issues, then therefore, this is the model I should use. Here's the transformations I should use. Here's the interpretation. Here are the visualizations. That is, that kind of like turnkey decision-making step-by-step is just not how science works in most other contexts. 
Uh, instead, it is a process of sort of incremental rational decision making to say, well, let's model it one way. Let's try to understand why it works and why it doesn't. Let's go back to the literature on that model and read up on that model and try to understand why it works the way it does. And let's kind of go through this iterative process of understanding the statistical approach underlying what we're doing. Uh, and then be very transparent about that, saying, well, you know, we tried this approach, we tried this approach, this approach makes sense for this reason, this one doesn't make sense for this reason, and here's the ultimate conclusion we got to. Sort of a, a deductive or inductive or combination of the two process toward creating knowledge and creating meaning. So that means that there's not a turnkey approach. There's no single paper I can point you toward that will give you like a flow chart saying, here's exactly when you use each of these thousand different model types. Because it is a lot of judgment and it is a lot of ambiguity in terms of which of those will actually work the best. And that's a very important piece of context for machine learning because it really, it, it really captures the way that, that people approach machine learning projects coming from the data science side. They think of it as an engineering problem to say, you know, there's a right answer out there and we need to discover it versus a scientific approach where you say, let me figure out what the prior research literature says is the right answer and then just do that thing. It's a very different mindset. So a common concept that we've been kind of dancing around but now can give some formal name to is the bias-variance trade-off. Uh, this describes a sort of counterbalancing that occurs in model selection where increased bias in parameter selection results in decreased variance in estimates across samples. So that's, that's a complex sentence, so let me, let me break that down a little bit. In statistical approaches, we are often targeting decreased bias as the primary goal of prediction, meaning that when I look at the coefficients that came out of a regression analysis, I want to be able to say definitively that this coefficient represents the number of points change in Y associated with a one point increase in this X when all other predictors are held exactly constant at zero. That is a very technical definition uh, uh, of, uh, of what those coefficients mean, and that is the purpose of regression. It is an, they are unbiased estimates of population values given that setup. The problem is that when you prioritize zero bias, that also means that you're essentially optimizing as much as you can to the individual sample composition that you have. Uh, meaning that if you, uh, when you run an OLS regression, you are going to describe the sample you have really well, but out of sample, across samples, you're going to uh, increase the amount of variance you see in predictive accuracy. So say, for example, in your model, you get, say you're doing one of these, uh, the, you know, imbalanced end in decay ratio kind of problems, and you have 300 cases and 200 variables, you're, and you get an R squared of 0.4. Great, looks fantastic. But the variance in out of sample prediction is going to be huge. You can might be at anywhere from negative 0.1 to 0.8 out of sample based on your uh, based on what you created because you have created a model with the minimum possible parameter bias, uh, which maximizes the variance in that out of sample prediction. What uh, machine learning does is explicitly target the other side of that and say, well, where can we strategically add bias? We, we sacrifice uh, model accuracy. We add bias to our model in order to achieve greater consistency and also greater predictive power out of sample. That makes individual coefficients a lot less interpretable. They, they no longer mean what I just said. Uh, the classic definition of a, again, a coefficient in regression when you do ordinary least squares is the number of points increase in Y for a one point increase in X uh, when all of the predictors are held zero. And we want to get the best estimate of that value in the population we can. But the population really refers to the population that generated this data set you're staring at, not the population of possible uh, application areas for your model. So when we add bias to those estimates, we can actually improve the consistency of prediction, which is a, a very unintuitive, I think, when you come from a, statistic, a purely statistical approach because everything's so much about coefficient interpretability. But it, it is what happens. And I'll actually show you an example of how this works using a real data set, using a personality data set uh, a little bit later. Uh, one of the when, once you accept this idea though that adding bias can improve prediction, improve the generalizability of prediction, uh, 
Uh, that means that if you keep pushing, you get to the point where you say, well, wait a minute, does it even matter if individual coefficients are predictable? And if individual coefficient, if the predictability of individual coefficients doesn't matter at all, that actually opens up a huge range of options in terms of predictive modeling, which is where something you've probably heard of at this point called deep learning came from. Because in deep learning, individual, the importance of individual predictors is just, it's just gone. There is no way to even decompose what individual predictors mean in that context. And yet, we get better, more generalizable prediction out of deep learning than we do out of almost any other approach, given adequate sample size and a number of other important factors. Computer vision is a really good example of this. Um, what computer vision just refers to is converting images into data sets and using those data sets to predict things. Say, for example, the most simple uh, and the, the starter problem if you ever try to do computer vision is how do we create a predictive model to predict what number is represented in a picture of a number, right? So they're like, say, handwritten numbers. There's a lot of different ways to draw a nine or an eight or whatever else. So how do we create a predictive model to predict what number is this in reality versus the data set, which is this picture? So that's, that's computer vision. And the most simple way to do it, uh, and the starter way that you always do it, is to decompose the picture into individual data points of light. So say, for example, you have a data set consisting entirely of uh, uh, numbers written in black ink on a white background. Well, that means that every pixel in that picture can become a variable of white or black or perhaps grayscale, depending on how where you are between the two. So that means if you have a high-definition picture of an image, which is a 1920 by 1080 uh, picture, you now have millions of variables for what is probably not a millions of cases data set. And yet, we don't really care about the interpretability of each individual piece of light, of each pixel in that picture. We really only care, well, can you take the picture and predict what number it is? That's really ultimately all we care about in that context. So that means we're, we don't care about bias. It's totally unimportant. It doesn't matter if we're accurately representing, you know, does pixel 350 over and pixel uh, 600 down do we have an accurate estimate of the importance of that pixel? It doesn't matter. It's totally irrelevant. So instead, we can say, bias it. Who cares? As long as we have little variance in predictive accuracy and a high R squared. If I can get that R squared to like a 0.97, I don't really care why it works. I just need to know that it does. And that's how you end up with you know, Google image search, for example, where when you search the word car, that it can figure out where cars are because it has given up on the individual parts of those images and created crafted data sets that enable you to have relatively little variance and accurately identify which pictures have cars and which pictures don't. Uh, so that's, that's what that trade-off enables you to do. Having said that, sometimes uh, throwing bias out completely does have downsides. So there's a, bi a bias variance trade-off inherent to every machine learning problem. And sometimes you want, you want to move within that spectrum, depending on the specific nature of the problem and depending on who the stakeholders are you're trying to argue with, uh, especially in um, social sciences where you have real Stakeholders, like in political science, if you're trying to argue toward like lob with lobbying groups and industrial organizational psychology, when you're trying to convince people in organizations to do certain things, there are situations where interpretability does matter. So it's important to recognize that there is a trade-off and where your decisions kind of fall uh, within it. All right. So let's go through a, a more worked out example of how exactly linear regression is sort of a machine learning problem and sort of not. You, you probably learned ordinary least squares regression using these formulas, where you have y prime equals bx plus a, meaning you have a slope and an intercept in the prediction of uh, uh, expected values. You can calculate the slope by looking at the correlation times the ratio uh, of your sigmas, uh, which is really, and you, you see the computational formula right there to figure out what your slope is. Uh, and then once you have your slope, you can calculate your intercept term just by reverse engineering the original formula. Right? So you probably did that by hand when you were learning to do regression. No real mystery, you know, rise over run slopes. It's all very, very, uh, 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 you know, rote at this point. There's a single obvious way to do it. And you might have even learned, if you took it in a stats class, uh, versus just looking at, uh, uh, you know, summary lines, that what you're really doing when you do that is minimizing uh, the sum of squared residuals, this idea of misprediction of individual data points based on a shared regression line, right? Uh, 
we're trying to figure out what's the single line that minimizes the distances between individual points and their predicted values. And there's only one, you probably remember the term, line of best fit, right? Where this occurs. So we can calculate all of that. We can calculate uh, our error terms to figure out how badly our regression is working. We can calculate the actual regression terms themselves, the coefficients, the intercepts, and the individual predictors. Um, but what would you do if you didn't know those formulas? Say you knew the error formula, because obviously anytime you have predictions, you could figure out how accurate the predictions are. That's easy. Uh, but you don't know the slope formula, and you don't know the intercept formula. How would you figure it out? Like literally, you, right now. If I gave you a data set, and uh, every time that you gave me predictions, I could tell you how accurate each individual prediction was, how would you figure out what B and A were? And the answer most likely is you would iterate, meaning you would guess first as to what the value of the slope probably is. You'd probably start with a one, because why not? Uh, and you would look at the uh, uh, predictive accuracy of that model, and you say, okay, that's whatever it is. My, okay, my R squared in this version, or my uh, error term in this version is 0.1. Great. And then you say, all right, well, let me nudge it up. Let me say instead of a B of 1, I'm going to try a B of 1.1. And you see, did that 0.1 predictive accuracy level go up or go down. And if it went down, uh, that means you've decreased your error, which means you're going in the right direction, and your next guess would probably continue in that direction. But if your error went up, that meant you were going the wrong direction, you'd be like, oh, oh, I probably shouldn't go down to 0.9, I should probably go up to 1.1 for my B. And you would iterate over and over and over again until you got to the bottom of that error curve, and you would find, okay, I found it. This is the value where you ha I have reached minimum error. That is the basic process in most machine learning algorithms. It's a process called gradient descent. Because what machine learning will do is, in most, ver in most of the supervised learning versions, the things that we're talking about, things we're focusing on, uh, that error formula that I was applying each time is called the cost function. Uh, which in the case of regression is your mean squared residual. And each time I iterate, I'm trying to find the bottom of the parabola of costs in this one predictor model. I'm trying to figure out, well, where do I actually minimize cost? Where is my error term the lowest given co various combinations of B and A? And really B is where we're focusing. Uh, in what gradient descent refers to is the idea that each time that you make a couple of guesses, you actually can figure out what is the slope of change that we just encountered. And over time, you can figure out where does that slope begin to even off, and you can then iteratively predict in a more efficient fashion, rather than just kind of blind guessing like you would do if you were doing it yourself. The computer can say, okay, well, I had this much of a slope jumping down between 0.1 and 0.2, and that slope evened up a little bit going between 0.2 and point, guess, guess 2 and 3. So that means that, that the most likely finish point is probably over here somewhere, so my next guess is going to be all the way over here. That's gradient descent. Um, some, the, a version of gradient descent is stochastic gradient descent. Uh, stochastic just means is a statistical term for randomness. It's a little more complicated than that. But the basic idea is you're sort of randomly jumping and then using feedback from those random jumps to get more and more precise jumps until you can figure out exactly where the lowest point is. You can solve regression the same way as machine learning. Like you can solve it that way using these iter iterative guesses, which is how most machine learning is solved. Uh, most machine learning algorithms in this kind of supervised space are solved. Um, so you are actually able to solve an ordinary least squares regression problem using stochastic gradient descent, which is effectively a machine learning method. See, everything overlaps. They're all, they all have very tightly related, uh, interconnected kind of meanings in those ways. What we're going to do to do that is a package in R called Carrot. Carrot is enormously important uh, because what it does is it coordinates machine learning functions across these thousands of different packages that are available in order to give a single unified framework for doing machine learning problems. Uh, it doesn't itself contain any machine learning. What it's really doing is coordinating between these different packages, of ma different machine learning packages, and providing a common syntax. So notice, for example, how we had to go about differences between ordinary least squares regression and ANOVA, where we had to learn different functions and different approaches and different visualization and different, different ways to piece apart all the functions. Imagine having to do that for a thousand different models. Uh, 
So what caret does then is unifies all that where you can just change one word and switch between one model to another. This is really important because of hyperparameters. Again, remember that hyperparameters are like these specific ways to tune models, to change their priorities and change their goals. Uh, so every, diff every model has its own hyperparameters, and they all have different names, they all have different purposes. Uh, and what Carrot will do is automate a lot of that hyperparameter process. It will, it will has a database, essentially, of what are the hyperparameters for each of these, uh, each of these thousand models, and which are the ones that are most important, what are the ranges of numbers that are valid for those hyperparameters, and will automatically select along the various spectra of those hyperparameters and test the ones that are most meaningful. And we'll, we'll see an example of that. Um, you do need to know how to use the individual machine learning packages to use their functions in Caret. So even though you can automate hyperparameter tuning like that, if you're really going to like publish a paper based on machine learning, you want to know what the parameters were that were being modified. So you're going to want to go back and read the papers of the models that, that you've chosen <laughs> so that you know what exactly is going on under the hood when you are uh, doing this. And I'm going to show you one example of how to do that using uh, what's called elastic net, uh, which is a type of machine learning. Uh, and I'm going to show you what their hy those hyperparameters mean and how they're interpreted. But it's a process that you'll need to do for any machine learning that you might want to do. Basic supervised machine learning with Carrot is actually really, really simple. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and jump into our studio. Uh, I'm going to load up the tidyverse, because why wouldn't we? I'm also going to load up psych, because the psych library contains uh, data sets that uh, are more, make more sense, you know, uh, for the kind of stuff we're going to be doing. I'm also going to load up the Carrot library as well. Uh, in order to, to give us uh, you know, access to the machine learning stuff that we're going to do. I'm going to get the MSQ data set out of Psych, which is uh, a, pers a, a mood questionnaire. Uh, we can, once it actually loads up, we'll be able to see what the variables uh, it contains are. Uh, and I'm going to create a tibble based on MSQ. Uh, I'm going to create a table based on MSQ uh, that, uh, there we go, took a minute to update. You can see it has all of these different uh, variables in it related to mood. I'm actually going to choose this first set going from active down to wide awake, which is essentially a mood questionnaire, the MSQ. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can predict mood, at, uh, I can use mood in general to predict uh, neuroticism, just as uh, an outcome. So it essentially says, could I use a person's mood to predict their personality trait neuroticism? That's the question we're going to ask. Whether that's meaningful or interesting or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just going to be convenient for uh, what we're doing right now. So I'm going to select all the variables from active to wide awake, and I'm also going to select neuroticism. Uh, and I'm also going to, just because it would add a lot of complexity if we didn't, I'm only going to look at uh, complete cases, meaning I don't have any, I don't want any missing data in my data set that I'm working in here. You would never do that in a real project, of course. You would want to use some kind of meaningful imputation, like a EM algorithm, ex expectation maximization type algorithm, or mice for multiple imputation chain equation, whatever it might be. You would use a real uh, uh, missing data approach. But it adds a lot of complexity uh, in terms of the code. And for the examples I want to give you, we just, I don't want to deal with that. So we're, so we're not going to. Um, the, oh, not MSQL, just MSQ. Whoops. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we're going to run this data set. You can notice there was a lot of missing data in there. But MSQ tibble has 1742 cases and 73 variables, meaning we actually have pretty good end decay ratio with this data set. And that's going to matter more in just a minute. So let's first of all look at um, uh, neuro did I spell that? Yeah, neuroticism uh, regress onto everything else using the uh, data set that we just created. And a summary just so we have a starting point. And you can see we can get a multiple R squared of 0.258 and an adjusted R squared of 0.226. Let's now do exactly the same thing, but we're going to do it within the caret framework. Neuroticism, neuroticism. Uh, regressed on everything. Uh, our data is MSQ. Keep putting an L there. Tibble. Uh, oh, I'm trying. Thinking of MySQL. It's a database language. Definitely don't want to do that. And I'm going to put method equals LM, and then I'm going to do a summary of model two. 
And you'll notice it is the same thing. Because what caret is doing here is actually invoking the lm function in order to run what's in contained within this train function. Now what's cool about that then is that I can copy paste this and create a model three and switch over to a more explicitly machine learning network, which is a GLM net, which does elastic net modeling plus lasso and ridge regression. Uh, and I can just run that with only changing that one word and look at my model summary and get R squareds out. So I have just changed over from basic ordinary least squares regression to elastic net machine learning in quite literally one word of change. Now you'll notice what's interesting about this is the frame, the output is very different. We're not getting individual coefficients, although we actually could with elastic net for reasons that will make more sense a little bit later. Uh, you will also notice that we have the same, it says summary of sample sizes, kind of odd that it has that. Uh, it did 25 repetitions of bootstrapped re resampling. Don't know what that is yet. No pre-processing. Don't know what that is yet. And it gave us a bunch of different R squareds. Well, the piece of this that you can get already is that uh, this is hyperparameter tuning, which it is done automatically. And you'll notice there are, in fact, two hyperparameters for GLMnet, one being alpha and one being lambda. Without more information, you have no idea what those things are. Uh, we will actually talk about alpha and lambda. This is the machine learning algorithm we're going to step through uh, through this. But you can see that depending on hyperparameters, you get quite different R squareds, ranging in this case from 0.175 up to 0.208. Um, and you can also notice that it selected final values for the model of alpha 5, uh, which is here, and lambda 3, 2. So this is the final model that it selected, which was actually the one with the highest R squared. This is a root mean square error of approximation. You also notice that it has the lowest uh, uh, error, and mean absolute error also uh, is lowest. So that emerged as the best model. If we compare these R squareds back to up here, you'll notice the multiple R squared in our original model was 258, which is probably a little high because we had you know, quite a lot of predictors here. Our adjusted R squared was 0.226, a little bit lower, and that actually approaches this R squared of 0 0.20, uh, 0.21. And actually, I would probably trust that 0.21 a little more than I would trust the 0.226 in terms of what is the real estimate, the, the real out of sample kind of generalizability of R squared, uh, at least using elastic net machine learning, which is, of course, a very particular approach to machine learning. Uh, so yeah, that's it. We've done machine learning, we've done hyperparameter tuning, tuning, and we predicted a good model. If we then use the predict function, like we did with regression on model three, it would because it selected this final model, it would use the coefficients that it pulled out of that model in order to create predictive values. And otherwise, it works exactly like regression. And that's it. That's the whole thing. We've now done machine learning. Uh, there are a lot of uh, other features, though, to pay attention to. So let's, let's go back to that. Uh, one of the things that you can do with the Caret machine learning package that's really useful is what's called pre-processing, which enables you to do different uh, analyses, uh, bef uh, or not analyses, different sort of procedures on your data all, long all wrapped into one command. A really common approach is missing values handling, where you can do median imputation or k-nearest neighbors or a couple of other things um, it, automatically without having to create kind of an intermediary data set. Uh, I personally have not found doing missing values within Caret to be super helpful uh, because it does it differently in certain cases. Um, K nearest neighbors in particular has uh, also has its own kind of uh, uh, tuning system. So you might want to actually run K nearest neighbors for missing data imputation separately and then get an imputed data set and then run that in Caret. Um, but there are a lot of other pre-processing approaches that actually do work great. Uh, you can do centering and z-score standardization. You can do box cast transformations for nonlinearity. Um, those are really useful just as standard steps, especially centering uh, and rescaling. Uh, box scale, uh, uh, the box cocks can be useful if you have a lot of skewed data and you just want to use, and you do want the interpretability of coefficients that so that is important to you uh, for what you're doing. Uh, Listwise deletion of non-varying predictors is important in certain machine learning contexts, especially where you get like massive data sets with ridiculously huge number of predictors and you don't really know where they came from, you may actually have uh, two predictors that are perfectly correlated and you didn't realize it. And if you throw that into any sort of machine learning model, it's going to say, oh, you have 
perfect multicollinearity or perfect collinearity between two of your predictors, and the model will fail. So as a result of that, is if you put in a preprocessing of ZV, then uh, it will automatically delete one of those, so you don't have to uh, deal it deal with it. The um, Oh, actually, I'm thinking of a I'm thinking of a different one. Sorry, uh, that's core down below. Uh, C O R R, where anything if it covaries 0.9 with one and another. Z V is if you have a uh, hundred percent cases with non varying values. Uh, it's really common in uh, certain contexts, uh, or more common in certain contexts. Like if you have uh, natural language processing, and you're breaking apart your words into variables that you're using, um, or and you might, for example, have the word a or the in 99% or all uh, or even 100% of your cases, and that's not really interesting. So this would automatically delete those variables. Uh, NZV is close. There's a specific cutoff. You need to read the documentation to know exactly where the cutoff is, but it's the same basic idea. Uh, PCA runs a principal components analysis on your predictor space and then just uses the primary components that it pulls out as predictors instead of the original data set, which is a sort of a type of semi-supervised machine learning. Uh, and then conditional X, which is if you're doing a classification problem where you're predicting discrete outcomes, it will remove predictors if you don't have uh, a cross. So that's a really common problem that people uh, face if you've ever done a lot of categorical work. And you say you were doing, oh, I want to look at the intersection of four different demographic variables. And there's some intersection point where there's nobody in that category. Um, say, for example, you're looking at like years of experience and it's been, for whatever reason, um, uh, polytomized, and you have like 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, uh, or whatever. And then you have ages, where you have zero, uh, you have like 18 to 22, 23 to 25, whatever it might be. There might be combinations of experience and age, like 15 years at age 18 to 22, uh, where there's nobody in it. There's nobody at that intersection point. And so conditional X will automatically remove those uh, remove predictors and adjust your framework uh, so that you don't have that problem and have to manually diagnose it, which for certain prediction problems can be really useful. Uh, there are also uh, terms called tune length and tune grid, which you looked on in data camp, where you can choose the number of tuning parameters to look at by default. Tune length is the quick and easy way to do it, where if you have a random parameter and you don't really know what the parameters are and you just want to see how it goes, then you can say tune length three and it will randomly choose three points at high, medium, and low ranges of each hyperparameter for each hyperparameter and then cross them. You actually saw that in, uh, in R because this is the default. You can see it chose three levels of alpha and three levels of lambda and crossed them and did that by default. So tune length here is uh, automatically three. So here we can go back and enter tune length five and rerun that. Uh, and what it's going to do is it's uh, instead of looking at uh, three, you can see now that it's automatically identified five uh, meaningful points along lambda and along alpha and selected them. And that gives you a little bit more precision in choosing uh, ideal hyperparameters, which may or may not actually matter in terms of prediction. You can see in this case, the R squared still all seem to be hover hovering around the same point. I'm going to change this to uh, three, even though it's the default, we're just going to leave it there. Tune grid and expand.grid then is a way for you to choose each value for each specific tuning parameter that you're interested in. So in this example below, for method ranger, which is random forests, you can do tune length 10, which changes just one factor uh, that you're interested in, which is the m tri uh, uh, hyperparameter. And it will uh, just choose 10 values for m tri along the spectrum that it thinks is meaningful. Alternatively, you can use expand grid to choose a wider range of values. Uh, in this case, you can see a way to, to control both alpha and lambda in GLMNet, which is what we've been doing. You can get a full list of methods using names, uh, get model info. I'm going to do that down here, get model info. Uh, you might find this to be quite uh, overwhelming because right now, by default, Carrot will handle 238 separate models. Uh, and you can also, that doesn't mean those are the only models available. Those are just the only models that are kind of built into Carrot. Uh, so if you wanted to do something that wasn't in that list, you would have to do it manually. But most likely, anything that you might need is probably located somewhere within this. You can also find this list and more information about them at this website, uh, topipo.github.io slash caret slash trainmodels by tag. 
And this has a bunch of sorting so that say, for example, I was interested in L2 regularization, I can jump down and see all the different uh, specific methods that I can use that incorporate L2 uh, regularization. One of those being GLMNet, the one that we are currently uh, kind of experimenting with. So we can then in that way look at different methods and we can look at uh, all the potential hyperparameters for them. We can either let Caret automatically handle hyperparameter tuning or we can enter them manually, just as many options as you uh, might want. Uh, so now we get into more some more specific machine learning approaches and what they mean. Uh, machine learning is a, a very diverse set of uh, prediction questions. We're going to focus again on supervised ones. Uh, there are many unsupervised and reinforcement and so on as well. Uh, but the supervised ones are the ones you most likely have heard of uh, and also ones you're most likely to need. One is the decision tree. Uh, decision trees can be regression or classification based and they change their approach a little bit based on what those are. Um, a very simple classification tree follows this general pattern. One, you look at your y, your predicted value, and then each x to see which one creates the two most homogeneous groups. Uh, and that becomes the root node of your tree. For each classification created by the root node, you do a homogeneity test. And if you get better overall prediction based on some standard with a new classification, you split further. And if you don't, you stop. So this becomes a leaf when it stops. And you, your tree ends up with a lot of leaves uh, as it continuously makes uh, decisions going down these various paths. Uh, you recursively hit this process. You go all the way down this leaf, then on down th this leaf path, and this leaf path until you hit your various stopping rules, which say, all right, you're only predicting an additional X percentage of variance, or there could be some other standard. Uh, all right, I'm going to stop now. And then you go back through your entire set and you prune, meaning you identify, all right, now that we have our overall model, which of these individual leaves actually doesn't help by removing individual uh, leaves? Where do we get better prediction in the end? And uh, it will refine that kind of iteratively. Uh, regression trees, that's a classification tree. So a regression tree works kind of the same way, but it's based on probabilities instead of actual assignment of individual cases. Here are a couple of examples of decision trees. So in the first data set, you might, for example, notice, oh, well, looking at uh, uh, self-reported sex results in the greatest uh, homogeneity of the two groups that results. So the probability of survival is uh, close to 50-50 going on either way. So you create two categories based on yes or no to answer that question. And you go down the second path. And for survived, it means, all right, if sex is male, no, survived is 36%. And there's no additional cuts we could do in order to get better, uh, greater accuracy with that. Uh, on the other path, we say, oh, but if we do is age greater than 9.5, which can be determined in a lot of different ways, we do get better prediction and you can create uh, new predicted categories going down the, uh, down the chain. And you can see another example of that uh, on the right. The disadvantage to trees is that they are extremely fragile in terms of uh, figuring out what your ultimate predictive pattern is, because it's not it's not just what is the greatest heter uh, homogeneity of groups at stage one. There are a lot of different rules, and it's not really always clear what the best step one rule is. So you can end up with uh, vastly differing trees that end up with similar kinds of results and sometimes not so similar results. That led to the creation of what are called random forests, which are, as you might expect, lots of trees, uh, where you basically select random subsets of predictors, sometimes random subsets of data. It, it depends on the exact approach you're taking um, in order to minimize the case of overly influential cases. Um, you don't want to overfit, and trees by themselves are extremely prone to overfitting. Uh, so instead, you randomly subset your trees in different ways. You say, all right, this one's only looking at this subset of predictors, this one's only looking at this subset of predictors, this one's only looking at these cases, and so on. And you create what's called an ensemble model by averaging the predictions across all of these different trees in order to predict your outcome. And ensembling like that tends to be a way to increase R squared and uh, to uh, increase or decrease the amount of variance in your final models. So here you can see this, this interaction again uh, also between these various pieces. One of the advantages to random forests and trees for that matter is it sort of implicitly models interactive, me only meaningful interactive effects. If you're using a regression-based model, you have to choose which interactions you want. 
uh, whereas in a that you want to include as as predictors. Whereas in random forest, it's sort of automatically extracted through the process. Uh, so you sometimes get really good prediction out of random forests as a result of these kind of emergent interactions that you don't necessarily know where they are. Um, and if you just threw them all into regression, then you might overwhelm the model. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the basic idea behind random forests. Uh, another, the, another common one, which is the one that our example is in so far, is lasso and ridge regression. Uh, lasso, which stands for uh, least absolute square shrinkage operator, I think, um, and ridge regression uh, are essentially still regression, ordinary least squares regression, but they prioritize the automatic, uh, they, they allow for the automatic selection of which predictors should be included in the model. Um, remember that in machine learning in these supervised approaches, the goal is to minimize cost, right? And in ordinary least squares regression, cost is defined by the residual mean square, the average distance between uh, the predicted line and the individual cases that have been observed, right? In terms of y, what's the difference in predicted y? So in lasso and grid, the idea is, well, wait a minute. If we just allow that process to go the way it normally would, we're going to end up in certain cases with just monstrously huge coefficients. Take, for example, our 100,000 case scenario, uh, or 100,000 predictor scenario, like in a computer vision problem, and we only have 1,000 cases. What's going to happen in that situation in ordinary least squares is because you have 10, 100, however many cases to describe each, or, or variables to describe each individual case, it's going to do that, and you're going to end up with these massively huge coefficients. You're going to have like, all right, associated with x1 is 10 billion, and associated with x2 is negative 15 billion, because those massive numbers have the greatest leverage to create as precise an estimate as possible when used in combination. So what Lasso and Ridge do is they explicitly penalize massive coefficients, and they add those penalties into their cost functions. They do this using, what Lasso does is adds L1 regularization, which means that it penalizes based on the absolute values of the coefficients, the parameters that it gets. So uh, you quite literally add in those coefficient values into your regression formula, uh, or into your mean square residual formula, your cost function, uh, and try to minimize that in addition to the, the normal mean square residual. In uh, Ridge, you do L2 regularization. So instead of looking at absolute values, you look at squared coefficients, and you try to minimize those values. And what elastic net does is it tries to minimize both of those simultaneously, and you try to balance how much of each one gets prioritized. Alpha refers to this balance term, and lambda refers then to uh, the cost function, uh, or the weight associated with each of those bias terms. Now here is a fun, a fun fact about machine learning, is that as you get into it, you start to realize that the formulas are much easier to understand in certain cases than the narrative descriptions of them. If I had learned, for example, about ridge regression and lasso and elastic net using what I just said, I would not have understood it. But what made sense to me are the formulas themselves. That first formula should look very familiar to you. This is the cost function in ordinary least squares regression, which is really just the sum of the squared residuals. And you can see it literally in the formula. Take each individual uh, observed y and subtract the observed y to figure out the distance between the predicted value and the observed value. Get the difference between them, square it, and add them together. That's your sum of squared residuals. And we can also turn that into an average. Not really important for this. But this is one type of cost function. Uh, instead of looking at mean square, we're just looking at sum of squares, but you, you get the idea. In ridge regression, we take literally that same term, right? You can see it. It's right there. There's your sum of squared residuals. And we add in a new term, which is literally the sum of the squared weights. So if you have an x1 and an x2, you just get the weight associated with x1, which is b sub 1. You get the weight associated with x sub 2, which is b sub 2 and you square each one, and you add them together. 
that's it. That's the whole process. There's no more complexity than that. Uh, and instead of trying to minimize the sum of squared residuals, you're trying to minimize that sum of squared residuals plus all of those weights squared. But we add in this other term, this uh, lambda, which refers to, well, how bad exactly is the penalty? So in this case, there's sort of a natural metric, right? We're talking about the sum of the squared residuals, so it's going to be in the scale of whatever the uh, whatever y is. It's going to be in terms of like squared y difference units, right? So this can be, depending on what your weights look like, depending on what your predictors look like, this lambda can really dramatically emphasize or barely even register the penalty term here. So where does lambda come from? And the answer is hyperparameter tuning. There is no single right answer for lambda. There's a range of lambdas that people typically use, but it is not actually based on any one correct answer. So this is part of that hyperparameter tuning problem. In lasso regression, which is L1, notice that these are identical formulas, except instead of a squared B, we have the absolute value of B. So we just take that weight associated with uh, the first predictor, the weight associated with the second predictor, we take their absolute values and we add them together. That's it. Process-wise, this means that lasso can, at the end of the day, actually assign a weight of zero to a predictor, whereas ridge will not really do that uh, because of the squaring. So there is uh, a little bit of a difference in terms of how they optimize and how they penalize having those gigantic coefficients, um, which leads people to do elastic net, which is really just the combination of these two. So here's ridge, which I showed you already, and here's lasso, which I showed you already. Again, just sum of squared residuals plus penalty. Now we have both penalties, as well as this new term, which refers to the balance of the penalties. If we have a 0.5, then we end up with 1 minus 0.5 and 0.5 over here, and then we have a 50-50 balance between ridge and lasso. But it could be anything, but obviously anything between 0 and 1. Meaning if this was 1, we would have 100% lasso. If it was 0, we would have 100% ridge, but any other value, we end up somewhere between the two. That means you should now be able to go back to our studio and be and say, oh, wait a minute, actually, I understand what I'm looking at because that is what's happening over here. On alpha, we're seeing essentially 10% uh, of, uh, uh, I have to go back even to figure it out myself. If it's uh, 0.1, then that means we're getting 10% lasso and 90% ridge all the way up to 100% lasso. So that's what's being modified here. Whereas lambda is that penalty term, so do we multiply uh, the weights by 0 0.001 all the way up to 0 0.709? And it just tests all of those in different combinations to see, well, what happens to root mean square error, r squared, and mean absolute error? That's it. That's all hyperparameter is do uh, tuning is doing. Every machine learning approach has different hyperparameters. This is how, what they mean for elastic net. But that means that for anything you do, you have to figure out, well, which what are the hyperparameters being used in this model? What do they mean? And do the numbers that I see make sense? Carrot is usually pretty good about it. It will usually pick ones that are standard in some way. Uh, sometimes you might want to choose other values, like say, for example, oh, man, I really wish that it included uh, a full, uh, last, a full uh, ridge model. You could add that in. You could use tune grid instead of tune length and specify alpha of zero. Totally up to you. And you might even do that. For example, if you saw that the optimal model was, oh, we see, actually, if you saw it was alpha equals 0.1, then you might say to yourself, oh, I wonder if it would have been even better if it had been zero. But you would only know that if you knew that alpha varied between zero and one. You see? So it's all about reasoning through those kind of processes. In this case, because lambda was 0.15, we might even say, well, you know what? Maybe I want some finer detail between 0.03 and 0.7. Maybe let's look at, you know, let's look at a grid that varies it by 0.1 and just see where that lands. That's the kind of decision making you might make in uh, doing tuning at this point. Okay, so that's the. Those are just two examples of common kind of machine learning approaches. Um, and an, an important contextual piece of this that you might be wondering about at this point is how does it know what the best tuning parameters are? Where does that, that come from exactly? 
Um, what it's doing by default right now is not actually a good approach. You don't want to do it that way because much like ordinary least squares regression, it is optimizing on the basis of the sample you have, not based on potential samples you could have. With a data set as large as this, with our n decay ratio being pretty high, it doesn't matter as much, but with smaller samples, it, uh, it absolutely does. What people usually do is one or both, and both is really better of the following, which is holdout validation and k-fold cross-validation. You did both of these uh, in data camp. Uh, what holdout validation refers to is just pulling out a piece of your data set and using it to test your final models. Whereas k-fold cross-validation is about splitting your data set into chunks, into folds, and then building models based on fold combinations. The most common of these are going to be five-fold and ten-fold cross-validation. In ten-fold cross-validation, what essentially that means is that you're building your model on nine folds at a time. You make a training set, a data set, out of the first nine, and then you predict the tenth. In, uh, then you repeat that process ten times. You look at folds. 2 through 10 predicting 1, uh, 3 through 10 and 1 predicting 2, 4 through 10 and 1 and 2 predicting 3, and so on. And then you take the average performance across those folds to figure out, well, how well is this model actually performing? Uh, in practice, you want to do most of your development work on a 10-fold or a 5-fold cross-validation model. And then once you're pretty confident you have a good model, then throw in the holdout just to see, am I still getting consistent prediction and holdout versus my cross-validation sample? If you have true out-of-sample predictions, you don't need to do that. So say, for example, you are looking at overtime data or you have a sample one and a sample two, you can do your tenfold in sample one and then do your sample two as your test uh, case. That's a, a better approach than doing within sample holdout. Uh, otherwise, you because this this sort of does kick the can down the road in terms of well, if there's something weird about your first sample, then you're just replicating whatever is weird about it, and you're not going to see true out of sample prediction and performance quite as well. Uh, you can quantify accuracy when you do these folds uh, in regression. It's very easy, and you've already seen it. We're looking at average R squareds across models or across folds, uh, and I'll show you uh, how to actually uh, do some of that fold work in just a second. Um, and if you're doing classification, it's a little harder. We have something called a confusion matrix, which is where you are essentially looking at sort of type one and type two errors at the individual case level. Like for in how many situations am I making correct predictions? In how many cases am I making good predictions that should have been wrong or true predictions that should have been false, false predictions that should have been true and true negative predictions. So those have different words in the data science space for some reason. Uh, you look at accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity to mean different dimensions of that problem. But ultimately, it's really just about like true positives, true negatives, false negatives, and false positives and more that like type 1, type 2 mindset that you probably have. Um, you also have a concept called the receiving operating characteristics curve, the ROC curve. Uh, ROC is a very strange term, but it comes from where this was originally used, which was in uh, kind of like a radio context, uh, old, I think it was 50s maybe. Um, the idea being that you have different accuracy levels depending on where you set your cutoffs. So say, for example, you set your you know true positive rate at everybody that scored above 80%. Well, that's going to, if that line is not perfectly straight, you're going to have better accuracy levels at different points along the curve. So ROC is just a way to calculate the area under the curve, the AUC, which refers to what percentage of the time are you essentially having making good decisions regardless of decision rule. So that's that's a just a handy technique. Uh, Carrot will generally select your best performing hyperparameters the way that we just did. Notice that it automatically selected hyperparameters for us and figured out what they should be. Um, but you should still have enough background and understanding to know what they are, as I've mentioned several times now. All right. So for comparing models, if you really want to know if different approaches are better or worse than others, then what you're going to need to do is uh, create your cross-validating, your cross-validated fold model. And you're going to want it to be consistent across all of the various models that you try. Uh, so let's uh, do an example of that. Uh, I'm going to go back into our studio. Uh, actually, first let's look at uh, let's let's look at um, actually running this with cross validation. We can do model four train, uh, and I'm going to copy all the stuff that I've already got here. Now I'm going to add train control 
uh, equals actual chain control, uh, method equals cross validation, and we're going to do tenfold, and we're going to do verbose iterations because that enables us to get a little bit more feedback so we can see kind of in real time what the model is doing. And look at model four, and we can now see that our squares have actually decreased a little bit using a cross validated model. Um, before we were getting this, I mean, slightly higher. Actually, it's not really very different. We had 208s, 207s. And now, oh, now we're actually getting a lot more consistency at around 0.2. So you can see by using a cross validated model where we're not really allowing outliers to be quite as influential in the overall data set, um, we're now seeing a lot more, a lot tighter prediction. Uh, actually, do we end up with uh, lower mean square errors? We had three sevens, three sixes. A little bit lower. I love there's three five nines, still three sixes. Yeah. Cross validated model is most likely giving us more consistent prediction um, because uh, it is. Um, uh, that's the whole point, uh, really, of doing this uh, is that we are uh, able to. Uh, we're not being as influenced by individual uh, influential cases. So, great. Let's uh, try a new approach uh, in order to demonstrate a little bit more how uh, some of this, uh, how sample size can be important and indicate ratios. I'm going to take a subsample, I'm going to do sub tibble using sample n of MSQ tibble. I'm going to do 300 cases. Uh, that creates a random subset of our original tibble. So you can see instead of 1,700, we now have 300, which means we have now about a 3 to 1, uh, maybe a little higher than that, but about a 3 to 1 uh, in decay ratio. If I run a ordinary least squares re uh, regression model right now, I'm going to stop typing neuroticism because I keep, I'm gonna keep thinking I misspelled it. Data equals MSQ sub tibble. What you're going to notice is that uh, our R squared is a little higher now. We've gone up to 0 0.39, whereas before we were, let's go all the way back, uh, 0.26. And in fact, the lower we get that sample size, the worse that's going to get. See, we're up to now 0 0.41 with 200 cases. That's pretty, pretty off. Uh, that is an accurate R squared for this subsample, but this subsample is obviously not representative of the whole group as a whole because we uh, have essentially are manipulating the bias variance trade-off very directly in order to, ma to minimize bias, but in this much smaller sample, where in this case we've got just over a two to one ratio of uh, cases to um, uh, uh, predictors. We are very, in order to maintain that low level of bias, we've now really increased the variance in model performance as a result of that. So you're seeing a much higher R squared, also a much more inaccurate R squared in terms of generalizability. But what happens if we do this using our train approach? We are going to go ahead and add this in GLM net with five. We're going to do the same basic approach that we were doing before um, that we did with that previous model. We're gonna, oh, always the typos. We're gonna run this one more time. It's gonna take a little longer. There we go. And now if we look at model six, it's not gonna be perfect, at least it shouldn't be. But, oh, actually no, we're doing pretty well. You can see that the R squared's all still right around that 0.2 level, um, just as they were when we did this with, um, with 300, or with uh, 3,896 cases. Meaning we have actually managed to now get away with a sample size of 200 to get the same predictive accuracy out of sample that we had when we had 3896. However, our actual regression, uh, it was very inaccurate, relatively speaking. And you might even also notice that the adjusted R square is way over adjusted for that predictor complexity, where it thinks the adjusted R square is 0.07, but when we did our elastic net machine learning approach, we got much closer to that real value of 0.2, uh, which matched more what we got with ordinary least squares uh, earlier on. So you can really see kind of the power there, the, the demonstrated power there of, um, uh, of these kind of machine learning methods in terms of getting good generalizable out of sample models. However, I can guarantee you that if I looked at the individual coefficients in all of these models, they could be in some cases very different from one another because they're going to prioritize different things in the models that they are uh, looking at. So in order to make models comparable, we're going to have to uh, uh, define folds to be consistent 
so that we can use those folds uh, across every machine learning example that we want to employ. So uh, to do that, there are actually a couple different ways to do it. One is create folds command. Uh, that's not going to be fully ideal for our situation for reasons that I'm going to show you in just a second. Um, so if we do that, and what you're going to notice is that creates cases um, where literally the uh, Literally what's happened is the data set has been split up into these 10 components. The way that train works, however, is that if you feed these into, um, into train control, it's actually gonna run 10 different models of size 30 rather than the way that we actually want it to happen, which is we wanna use the nine folds to predict the one fold and we wanna cross that uh, nine times. So instead we're gonna use something called create multi-folds. Um, I, mean, I had to add a parameter to that. Create multifolds, k equals one, uh, times equals one, and you can see now we have 270 cases uh, within each fold. So we're gonna use that as the input into our, uh, into our model. So I'm gonna copy paste our model six into a model seven. And we are going to run that, and hopefully we will come up with a pretty similar answer. Yep, and you see our R squared's all still hovering right around 0.2 even though we are now using quite literally, uh, you know, we're using the sub data set, we're using less than 10% of the original data set, yet we're still getting pretty accurate uh, R, generalizable R squareds compared with our model five, which again, we were up in 0.46, I mean, huge out of, uh, hugely just out of uh, stock area. In fact, the adjusted R squared was also inflated, so that's not even a realistic estimate. Uh, compared to our original sample. So you can really see the advantages uh, there. But since we've created these multifolds, uh, that means now let's create a model eight, uh, but we're gonna use something different. So I'm gonna run it exactly the same way. Uh, oh, I actually didn't even use the folds, whoops. I'm gonna use index equals index. That's the thing we have to add. Model seven, model seven. Yep, see, there we go. We still have our R squares around 0.2, nothing's changed. In model eight, uh, I'm gonna make sure that's added back in also, so that there's a fair comparison between these two approaches. Uh, and then instead of GLMnet, I'm gonna use support vector machines. And one of the ways to do that is SVM linear three. I'm gonna run this, it's gonna take quite a lot longer. Um, support vector machines are what we would call more costly. Um, they uh, are more uh, computationally expensive, so it takes a little bit more time. Uh, there are some warnings there, which if you were really doing this, you would want to investigate. And when we look at model eight, you can see that we ended up with, um, uh, we ended up looking at a, a three by two comparison of tuning parameters uh, by default. Uh, and R squareds though are actually a little bit lower, but not sure how that compares in terms of the error terms. So that's when we're gonna use these resampling commands uh, right down here in order to compare those next to each other. So I'm gonna do summary resamples list of model seven and model eight. And that just gives us the mean, median, and some various other summary statistics associated with each of the approaches. You can see in the R squareds that medians, it looks like our, uh, in this case, model seven, or I, well, it's model one in this list, but because we didn't rename it. But model seven is uh, our elastic net. So it seems like that's performing better in terms of R squared. It's performing better in terms of RMSE and it's also performing better in terms of MAE. So this would be pretty good evidence that, you know what, ElasticNet is probably good enough for our purposes for our 300 case data set, uh, and we uh, don't really need to um, go further than that. Uh, if we wanna get that visually, we can use dot plot, which just simply puts that over here uh, in this format. R squared is not ideal because it shows the range to five for some reason, but you can see much more clearly what these uh, interquartile ranges are. I think those are interquartile ranges for, um, actually it shows confidence levels, so those may be confidence intervals, uh, but those associated with your uh, error terms and gives you a very quick representation of which models are performing better or worse. Um, but yeah, so with all of that, if you wanna practice these skill sets, if you really wanna get deep into machine learning, uh, and it's a good place to get into, uh, there are many data sets that you can practice on at archive.ics.uci.edu. Uh, this is a pretty cool website where they just have a bunch of data sets that are just sort of constantly appearing and they're very easy to download. Uh, and people that are contributing data sets that are really intended for machine learning purposes. Uh, 
So this, there's just, there's a lot of them. There's a huge number of data sets available here on many different contexts, 488 right now. Uh, and some of them have many, many cases uh, to play with. Some of them are longitudinal, some of them are cross-sectional, just so many variations. Some are more psychological than others, and some are more sociological, some are more poli-sci. Um, uh, you can see there's a category for social sciences, 26, and you can see some categories there, census data, Hayes, Roth, etc. So if you just want to play around, that's a great place to do it. If you really want to enter the big leagues, then what I suggest doing is signing up for Kaggle.com. And what Kaggle does is they actually run contests for creating the best predictive models, because yes, that's a thing people do in their free time. Uh, you can actually uh, enter yourself. It, there's no barrier to entry. And what you basically do is, is submit your best guesses as to the values for test sets for holdout samples um, given a data set that you're provided. So you're given a data set, uh, a training set, and you're told, here's a test set which doesn't have any DVs, doesn't have any predicted values. Um, predict values for that, and you can submit a certain number of times, and there's a leaderboard and so on. And it's just a nice, it's a competitive and interesting way to really practice your ability to build high quality predictive models and by high quality, of course, I really mean your ability to predict a test set. Uh, no other dimensions. Kaggle does not really care about any other dimensions of, of uh, predictive accuracy, uh, of uh, uh, model uh, feasibility. So in the real world, you would probably concern yourself with things like, uh, can we get these predictors on a regular basis? Is this a realistic model for us to be re-executing over and over again? Uh, Kaggle just wants to know your pure machine learning chops. So... Uh, strongly recommend if you're interested in this space and you just want to get a sense of how good you are, uh, this is a great objective way to do it, to look at the people that are the best in the world at machine learning and see uh, how they do. And uh, yeah, otherwise that's it for machine learning.